Hey guys, welcome back to the studio. Seems like I don't say that enough anymore, seeing as how I'm sure some of you guys have been wondering if I quit making videos or if I would ever post another video again. But here I am. There's been a lot of behind the scenes that have happened in the last several months and while I recorded and edited and then re-recorded audio that brought everybody up to speed, it seemed it never came out. I would start strong enough, then Divya off on a tangent that would end up off in a very personal rant. Editing was no better because what I wanted to share was quickly becoming apparent that I had quite a bit of healing to do before I was really ready to speak civilly about what I had been dealing with. In the beginning of November 2019, I was really ready to dig into getting some more regular content up. Maybe actually pre-recording all of the episodes and then posting them on a schedule rather than trying to film them one at a time. But for those that live in dysfunctional homes, you know that it's the rare occasion when your plans ever go off without a hitch. For me, the holidays have always been the worst time of year. Putting up a brave face so you can go spend time with a group of people whom I feel like I should be myself around. I should be able to tell my family anything. My dreams, my fears, my hopes, my frustrations. But it never has been the case. Instead, I drag out a great trunk of fear and regret, hold my ideas close to my chest, physically keeping as far away from them as I can, and I have learned to, to shut my mouth as much as possible. Since mom died, that's how things have been. The scapegoat goes to the holidays to make everyone else feel better. Then I go home, sick to my stomach, hating my life, hating my family, and hating myself. It starts for weeks beforehand, thinking up every possible angle that they could come at me from, figuring out ways to keep them away, finding ways to survive the attacks that they had been waiting for months to make, fortifying my mental and emotional defenses, reminding myself that their opinion of my life doesn't matter as long as I'm living my best life. The holidays for many quickly become a stressor of infection that rears its ugly head about every nine months and goes on for another four. And it seems every year it gets harder and harder to justify walking into that room, putting up with the cruelty, and feeling like you didn't do something to deserve it. After all, you are the one going back for more, right? In November 2019, I decided to change it up. I wasn't going to go. I wasn't going to put up with the abuse. I'm 44 and I don't need to be treated like a little kid. So I went to a friend's instead. At least then I wasn't alone. I knew there would be resentment for my siblings because they didn't get to spend the day playing kick the scapegoat in the kitchen, which now seems to be an annual pastime with my family. Instead, I got texts about how my father was in the hospital with pneumonia and that we would meet at my eldest sister's house for dinner and then go to the hospital from there. Well, you know what? I opted out of that as well. My father's for many years was literally the ringleader of the crap that happened at the dining room table. And if I was going to start living a better life for me, I had to come with some devastating prices. But not tolerating the abuse, even from my father, meant that I would also not go see him. The next several weeks would see my father in and out of the hospital for treatment of several issues, along with the fact that his cancer had come out of remission. I was trying to navigate the hardest situation I'd ever faced because I was doing it alone, and in my family's eyes, I was being selfish. But here's the rub. Everything going on with the many trips to the hospital and his health were like top military secrets, and I was not privy to know what was going on. Not even Dad would talk to me about it. Visits would end up with one or two questions, some small talk, and then a long, stressful period of silence. After about 45 minutes, I would leave, having accomplished nothing and wondering why I came. When I was little, I was a daddy's girl. Spending hours riding on the back of the lawnmower, going to the gun club, playing, or just watching movies with my dad. I loved to hang out with my dad. He always made me feel safe, and the out-of-control teasing hadn't gotten out of hand yet bringing a fish home from the pond after I stole his fishing pole, or whatever small critter I could hunt down and capture was not my mother's favorite part of the summer, but always made me feel like my dad was proud of me. You see, my other two siblings are nine years older than me, and with a huge age gap, they acted more like bullies on the bus rather than older sisters. I grew up in the country, so there's no neighborhood kids to go hang out with. I just had my imagination, and I learned to love it. 
Not having friends early on made making friends really hard later, though, and I was often targeted of bullying and targeted by kids for their amusement. You learn not to trust or like other people when there seems to be only two people you can ever go to. What made things worse was that the only two people I had to talk to had dark secrets too. My mom was manic depressive bipolar and both my parents were alcoholics. The older I got, the more aware of this I became until literally I didn't feel safe talking to anyone. No one was safe. When I was in middle school, my mom went to AA and got herself cleaned up and went to see a doctor proper, and my dad went cold turkey. All of this sounds great until you realize it's only been recently that they've made great forward strides in drugs to treat such mental illnesses. The years that it took them to get her meds right made things even worse. And dad wasn't around when mom would have her episodes, and going to talk to him was met with indifference. In high school, things ramped up to another level. My oldest sister was moving out and getting on with her own life, and while we didn't always get along, it was still a big change. The tension between my parents was so great that when she left, my mother took her room. And home became some place that was never really safe for me, but now it seemed to be just a little bit more dangerous. My junior year of high school, I was attacked on the street from a classmate. This would be the tipping point with my relationship with my father. While I filled out a police report, my mom decided to not press charges, and my father in turn claimed that it never happened, that I had made it up for attention, and that if it happened, I had asked for it. My attacker confessed, but the system seemed to fail me. The next year, he would go on to molest one of my friends in the hallway on school property. It turned out that he attacked many other members of my class, but because of prestige and pride, none of the girls had reported the attacks. Their boyfriends, upon finding the charges, squared off with him on the football field, breaking his arm and leg. Needless to say, he himself quit the football team that same week. But what I took away was that my parents weren't going to be the ones to protect me. Senior year usually finds itself with people picking out college courses, enjoying time with friends, and planning their future. Since I have an art channel, you would be correct in assuming that my goal was to go into art. Unfortunately, that's not the way that my parents wanted things. They were so much against my art that at one point they pulled me out of my art classes and my GPA tanked to nearly failing. Things at home were downright hostile and the hotbed topic was post high school college courses. You see, both my sisters had already gone to college and my parents already had a taste of the bills that came along with higher education. Both my sisters had changed their majors, so my parents were going to make damn sure that whatever major I chose would line up with their values and expectations based on their previous encounters with the expenses of my sisters. Needless to say, art was off the table. With no real major or reason to want to go, I spent my first year taking courses my parents chose and trying to keep up with having a secret support system of friends that were not allowed to be known by my parents. If my parents had their way, I wouldn't have any friends at all. Unfortunately, I got sick and fell behind in my Spanish course, and my professor advised that I drop the course to keep up my GPA. Just redo the course next semester. She didn't think it was a big deal. That's not how my father felt about it. And that night, I was too afraid to go home. So I spent the night at one of my secret friend's house, crying. That next morning, phone calls were made and plans put into motion to get me out of the house. Parents showed up with vans, and since most of my stuff had been packed for weeks prior, it was just a matter of packing my clothes and going. The following years, I learned what life could, would, and should be like. I never really could act totally normal in a group, and my friends accepted my weirdness rather than laughing at me. I always enjoyed making them laugh. Eventually, I got engaged and by my fiancé's and his family's request, tried to make up with my family, but it quickly became apparent that this was not a road that anybody wanted to be on. 
We both hated going over there, but eventually my mom, who is now on the correct medication, managed to patch things up. She was the only member of my family that managed to patch things up. Not so much with my father, who would not talk to me, we didn't even joke around, and overall I felt like I was beneath him or his affections. Holidays were doled out as even for everyone, but I never really felt welcome. That refrain was repeated with emphasis when my husband and I later divorced. Yet another nail in the you-don't-belong-here coffin. We have impressionable children and we don't want them exposed to your alternative lifestyle. Ah, uh, yes, the statement that came from my mother that was later repeated by my sister after my father's death. I remember both me and my husband gaping at that comment wondering what the hell they thought we do. So I stayed back, only going over there to spend time with my mom, who understood, but still had to live with my father and be a grandmother to my nieces and nephews. When mom passed, the floor fell out and her belongings were treated like trash with many comments about hoarding and garbage flying around. Finding time to donate her sewing materials to charity was taxing to them and an utter waste of time. Just throw it out was the mantra that became the everyday thing. They talked my dad into selling the house and downgrading, the con downgrading to a condo. Then it was just time. Apparently, just time waiting for him to go as well. My opinion was not wanted or needed. I was a burden coming down with ways to help Dad keep what he wanted. Dad, in turn, got weird. Don't know if it was Mom's passing, but suddenly he wanted to ignore the past 20 plus years and just go back to when I was a kid. Kisses goodbye, hugs, and let's do lunch. Okay, that was all way too much. You can't just erase the past. You have to deal with it. But that was something that would never happen. He wouldn't allow it. I wanted to talk about this, this big, huge gap between the two of us that had grown. No, if that's all you want to do, then leave. So we were down to small talk, which I hate. Choosing to skip the holidays was the decision I made for me. I would be fine seeing him when no one was around to gang up on me, but of course that wasn't good enough. I made efforts to do things I thought the two of us would enjoy that was more than lunch but they were also turned down. Not big things, just little trips where we might have a real conversation. But instead he opted for one last hunting trip to Wyoming. When he got back, he would fall ill and never recover. My sisters never saw the efforts. I didn't feel the need to keep score when it came to my visits or my relationship with our father. But as I said, since the holidays became a round of kick the scapegoat, I avoided Christmas as well. I would get texts from the oldest sister about his health, informed about the family get-togethers, but mostly just updates on his health. Four updates in three months before I got attacked about being a bad daughter. No phone calls, just texts. Dad passed away on leap day. There was no final goodbye or deep conversation. 
No closure. I was there, but I might as well have not been. I was definitely not included or welcomed. The password had been changed to the condo and I was told I had to change who I was in order to associate with my sisters or their families. Apparently this was all based on what happened when I was 18. The whole episode where I moved out. A pretty petty point considering it was 24 years later and I had tried numerous times to apologize for the way it was executed and that personally was between me and my father, not between me and my sisters who now made plans that all excluded me. But going or not going to these events was now mute point since COVID had canceled any and all plans my sisters had made. They in turn cleaned out the condo, sold it, and I guess we all moved on? In February, I received a phone call from Cheyenne. If that name doesn't sound familiar, then check out my three-part series on Jasper. It's more than just a memorial or an art tutorial. We'll talk about the role of pet portrait arts play in the healing of a broken heart and owner, Jasper and Cheyenne's own story, as well as the reality of domestic violence and pet abuse. Cheyenne, however, was calling because her most recent landlord had raided her apartment illegally and destroyed the Jasper piece by throwing it and many of her other belongings in the trash. It was heart-wrenching to hear her crying on the phone, but the fact is I donated the time and the materials to make the piece. She was using the expense of the piece to press charges against her ex-landlord. I, in turn, spent time on the phone discussing the cost of having it redone, which would end up over a few hundred dollars. A hard lesson for her, I'm sure, as the warranty paperwork as well as the insurance paperwork she was issued had been kept with the artwork on top of the fridge. Easily mistaken for any other document in a large envelope. Her landlord tossed it in the dumpster. Not sure what became of that mess, just that the memorial to Jasper is now gone as well. Not something I wish to repeat, however. Hopefully a lesson that more than just Cheyenne can learn from. If you would like more information, there is a three-part series on the piece linked in the description below. But the winter didn't hold all bad things. I did spend some time, money, and effort in going back to vending my art. This mute point as COVID has taken many fairs away and my new display now sits in storage, but the effort was there, so oh well. I'll be ready to show when the rest of the world is, I guess. But I've got some new pieces to share and hopefully some new stories to share as well. The good news is that this absence from my family has really done some wonders for my self-esteem and I'm feeling more settled and able to focus on my work. Just as soon as I turn my phone into airplane mode while I'm recording. I'm not
not trying to say that there won't be times when I just drop off the face of the world. Just hopefully that maybe it won't be because I don't feel like I have anything to contribute or that's worth watching. And if you're wondering about this piece, well, it was supposed to go with the watercolor version of the same piece. A kind of compare and contrast media, if you will. What was the point of the first version? What to do with all those horse show photos I've been telling you to collect, of course. Something fun to do. Create some carousel horses. But this one quickly, of course, got away on me because I was overthinking the design until I got discouraged and decided to just not finish it. It's still in the closet, and I can still finish it if anybody really cares to see it. Let me know in the comments. Until then, I'm off dreaming up the next adventure, signing up from the studio, y'all.